Uh, are we recording? Yeah, in a minute. Still starting it up. Okay. We are on. At least as far as I can tell. Feels like every every other month that we do this, the more I forget what we're doing. <laughs> Let's see. Get the chat window open. Welcome everybody. Maybe we can start off with, uh, geez, I don't even know what number this is. 20, 23. 23. Webinar number 23. I never seem to know what number it is. Well, luckily, I have, to, I have to edit the title every time. So it gives me a hedge start there. Good. Welcome on. Glad you can make it. I'll give you, let a few people stream, come in. Uh, find a seat. Yeah. Don't hog all the popcorn. So I was at, <clears throat> as Curtis knows, I was at NMRA last weekend, uh, which was outside of St. Louis. So we actually stayed in St. Louis. Nice, fun, uh, fun little trip. Good show, good attendance. Sunday was slow, but uh, that's <clears throat> that's kind of normal. I actually saw Michael Gross there. I guess Michael Gross is a um, the actor. Yes, railroad enthusiast. Model railroad yeah, you know what? Speaking of which, I actually saw an old YouTube clip, and it looked like it was back when he was doing the Family Ties days, mm -hmm. and he was actually he was actually introducing uh, some. A train program. I can't remember what it was, but I thought it was really interesting. So it's interesting that funny that you saw him there. So yeah, yeah. yeah. He Does he know anything there. about Marklin, or he just he just ignored you all completely? <laughs> uh, he was about to come to the booth, and then uh, Fred Hill from um, the original Whistle Stop grabbed him and took him the other way. Nice going, Fred. Thanks, <laughs> thanks Fred. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he models in Markland, but I did kind of want to maybe see if I could get him hooked on it, but he never came by. All right. Well, uh, I guess we'll get started, huh? What do you think? Or you want to wait a couple more minutes? Well, I mean, maybe we maybe if anybody has any questions, we can take a couple of questions first. Yeah, let's uh, welcome. Uh, good to see you guys coming in. See Norbridge joining us again. Nice. Thanks for joining us. And Zev, come on, Zev. I know you got a question about the turntable. Uh, we got a gentleman on YouTube, Mark Lindzeit. Uh He says he does like your ETE shirt. Ah, yes. Because I was just in St. Louis, I am sporting the Great Lakes chapter uh, ETE shirt. So I encourage everyone to uh, search out a local chapter and join if you haven't already. Oh, uh, we got my hand raised. Zev, allow to talk. Oh, I've been waiting for this, Zev. Unmute your microphone. Uh, can you hey. hear me? Yeah, we got you. Hey, Zev, how's everything? I'm doing fine, thank you. It's uh, Well, you you live in the Bay Area. Are you muggy at your house, Curtis? <laughs> yes, I am at, I am at home. <laughs> yeah, it's real muggy today out here in Dublin. Yeah. Um, the, um, how long has the 946, what is it, 81 been out? Uh, what is the nine four six eight one? Oh, uh, that's the the current uh, C C track turntable. I forgot. Uh, that's been out um, maybe a year. So I still don't understand why they're they've discontinued it and now they're making the the last digit two. Uh, well, because it's it's the next model, so they they move it 
to a different number because there's differences. Um, I actually was talking to um, Yanko from the factory about that this weekend, and he said that they made some slight improvements on it. Um, obviously, the color is different. Um, I asked him if the uh, little um, sensor pieces are integrated into the segments now. And he said yes. So hopefully he understood the question and um, those won't fall out in the new one. But um, as I keep saying, people keep kind of bashing this new one, even though it's technically now it's going to be the old one. It still seems to work fine as long as you follow the directions mount it correctly. I haven't had any trouble with anybody's once it's been mounted correctly. Yeah, that number is incorrect. So. <clears throat> yeah, it's probably um, 74862. Yeah, let's see. Okay, hang on. Just to show, let's see. Yep. So you can see, yes, the disregard 7286. That's an old note. So the top one here is 74682 or 74862. That's the new one. Yes. And you can see there's a, the, watch the color there. And if we go down to 74681 or 861, you see there's a big difference. There's a little stylistic difference there. Yeah. So I might have to order one as a sample to evaluate it looks like they uh they put a they put a wooden ring around it for yeah yeah it looks like it's a little long it just looks it, like it's longer it can be i'm trying to and it's darker hard to compare the two when you're yeah it's about the same length yeah yeah it's going to be the same molding for most of it <clears throat> so it's nice looking are they offering a trade-in <laughs> that's that's not up to us we're only technical support <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, honestly, I would, I, w I don't believe that they would have really focused on integrating those uh, sensor tabs. Um, the reason is okay. If you think about production costs, if if they do those different pins for wherever you want the track to stop, uh, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm misguided here. You're actually having to purchase the entire piece right segment here i'm assuming so but yeah but the thing is if they just change the insert it's just more cost effective for them to do it that way yeah okay. we'll have and, to wait and, yeah and frankly that that in my mind at least from the test and me operating it that is not the problem sev that really is not the issue the clearance on either side of those pins is is about a millimeter and that's plenty of clearance for the sensor yes Okay, usually what's happening is, is it's, I would assume, or my guess is, from my experience of it, is the problem is on the opposite end, and that's where the lever latch pulls back to allow the bed to rotate. And, and frankly, if your surface is not really flat, that tolerance is really kind of tight from what I've seen, and it will kind of grab onto one of these segments. It doesn't grab onto those pins, so the issue isn't the pin. And the, that's my experience with it. And uh, I, I don't need you guys arguing with me. That's my experience. If you have another experience, you're welcome to that opinion. But uh, it's it, just a, leveling is quite complicated feat. Uh, you know, depending on if you have rugs that your layout sits on on stands, et cetera. Yeah. Um, that, that that took a lot of work. Yeah, well, you know, something like that turned out, you wouldn't be putting it on the carpet anyways, right? You should be having some kind of bench work because the whole thing sits in a hole to begin with. Oh, no, I cut a hole in my floor. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. no, I mean, I do have bench work that yeah. sits on my, on my carpet. Well, you, you got to remember that these, if, if you're not supporting it by the fingers, like I keep saying, those segments that Curtis is pointing out, they pinch, the whole weight of the turntable is going to, pinch them in, so to say, and you got very little clearance. Um, keep going back up. I'm actually going to try to pull open the manual here, if I can find it. Oh, it'll be up to the top on the right. I, I didn't see it. To the right. Oh, here it is. No, they didn't show it. Uh, no, you have to use the manual from the old one. 
Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. There's, uh, there's no manual yet, but if you show the picture there real quick, Curtis. Hang on, let me zoom out. Large yeah. picture. Yeah, you know, the pinching, I think, was uh, yeah one of my big problems. Yes, and it's pinching on, like Curtis says, the, the locking lever for the... Um, for the bridge and yeah i've i've had that i've seen where it is pinching at that end also so it's not really those little encoder segments that's the problem even though you know they they do tend i wouldn't say they fall out but if you start digging your hand down there they could fall out in shipping because you know we all know that ups and whatever carrier i don't mean to name a name whatever carrier um they don't handle the stuff gingerly. Most of, most of it's automated. So yeah, you have to be careful of those and make sure they're all in. Press them all in when you get it. And then, uh, you, like we've even said, you can use a little bit of white glue in case you have to take them out or whatnot. That, or so you can take them out. Yeah, I definitely. Once they're in, they pretty well in. stay if it's on the layout. There's no problem with them. It's, uh, like Curtis said, the locking finger that seems to be sticking when it's not mounted correctly and, and the segments are pinched in. I'll see if I can locate a photo that I took of that mechanism there. But essentially there's, you know, there's a couple of things that uh, I've never really seen on any kind of device. They're using a micro servo that pulls back the lever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just like uh, if that servo, if, you know, it could be like if that servo is not being able to rotate fully, then it's not going to pull the, the lever back all the way or, you know, who knows what the tolerance is on how close that lever is to, you know, sending the locking mechanism forward. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, I got a picture of it. Let me kind of mess around and see if I can get one up to show you guys in a, in a bit. Um, I just got to do some weird stuff like transfer it over to whatnot. But let's have a look at the, uh, let's see if we can find the manual here really quick and look at it there. Cause there's- It'll be in that one. <clears throat> yeah, there you go. The manuals. Uh, yeah, so these are the pins for those who are not familiar with it. There's there is a right and wrong way that these pins need to be inserted. They just kind of get plugged in there. If they get met, you know, like if you put your finger down there and you push down on it when you're trying to lift up these track, yeah, be careful. You might make these loose. Um, you do have to make sure they're installed the right way. The only difference between what starts and stops that as far as the indicator goes is the spacing on these these sort of tabs um so there's the, the you see this with the wide gap is what you use for the tracks you want it to stop on and these are the ones that just allow it to pe keep passing through um and your whole rather than having to purchase this whole piece and then manufacturing this whole piece with track and stuff it's just you know it's sort of like they did on the old turntables so you just had to buy three of those or whatever um but in this case you just need these little pieces to make it uh, stop or start because uh you know it just depends on your arrangement right um yeah i don't think there's yeah there's no real picture of what the lever looks like no no yeah so let me uh let me see if i can process something like that maybe during when rick is uh going over the his topic there. I'll, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I'll just stop sharing here. All right. Uh, so yeah, we'll get back to that stuff. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, so just, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if I can lower your hand, go ahead and remove your uh, phone. Yeah. Thanks. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, is there somewhere online that lists upcoming train shows? Uh, there is. I don't know the name of it right now off the top of my head. Um, as far as train shows that we're at or train shows that have Markland, that's really hard to say. It's, it's harder to find Markland at a train show than it is a, uh, like a Eurowest or um, a club swap meet, so to say. <clears throat> The next question is kind of uh, interesting. Because I have an M83 where I set the dip switches to address one to four, but it assigned nine to 12 instead. Uh, the address is one to four, show empty on my CS3. They don't appear in red. Uh, 
but if the m83 won't budge from 9 to 12 oh okay so <clears throat> i would double check your sw dip switch setting i believe uh, one to four would be just dip switch one up um and i think that nine to twelve would be one and three up could be mistaken there uh double check your dip switch settings you can always um delete it and re-enter it or i think you can change the address in the settings when you go into the edit mode and then you click on the m83 not one of the addresses from one to four but in the article article list you click on the m83 itself i believe you can change that address i could be mistaken i don't think i've ever tried it i know you can do it for a signal where you can change the address even though it's in as an address it wants to put it in you can change it to the address that you want it to be um give both of those uh, a try and you know send us an email if it's not working yeah there's also other possibilities um uh, one would be that if you sort of had inadvertently um loaded something before mfx wise and it locked into those slots so you didn't properly delete it that's going to prevent those uh those addresses from being accessible right and if you chose uh find a new address rather than keep this address it would obviously move it along the next four addresses that are available in a row so um definitely uh let us know send us an email if, if that solves the problem all we get are emails of how how many problems people have we never get emails saying good job problems fixed <laughs> <No. laughs> so okay hang on let's see I don't necessarily want to show this whole detail, but I'm not going to avoid it. Okay, so let's look quickly at the turntable, um, the underside of the turntable. Okay, so you noticed on the left side of this picture, this, uh, I don't know if you can see the hand or the icon yeah, there. We can see the hand. Yeah, so that's the, that's the servo mechanism. That's the micro servo, and it just basically pulls back this lever. And that's what locks it on the other side is where the sensor is on the right side that's where the sensor is for those little tabs so this really is not the issue the issue is that this lever may not pull back far enough and and that tends to cause an uneven service like your track your turntable to maybe bind um and you know so the surface that i built on that you can barely see in the background there it was as flat as i could tell but you know it, it probably might not have been perfect um i did have to look at the a little closer uh so there's a little concern the you know one thing i can say you know and it's subjective uh, i don't really know whether or not it's true whether or not this thing could be just slightly shorter uh it looks like this thing would extend it in pretty far and you know just to give you more retraction length you know whether or not this needs to be as long as it is could it be shortened by like a half a millimeter or something like that and keep it from binding but essentially this is i, I believe this is the only thing that kind of gets caught up on the friction points uh it really isn't anything on that side you can you can what you might want to do is if you watch this thing travel around you're going to see that it doesn't really come close to the gap so this is the only thing that's hidden that you really can't see so uh, that's sort of my assessment on what makes the turntable maybe bind up um and uh, yeah that's pretty much i'll cover on that one so yeah <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> uh gentleman uh, sean he bought some new c track but the color doesn't match uh c track i bought 10 to 15 years the track is darker when did the color change <laughs> Well, I think they tried to keep it all the same, whether they changed the manu well, they didn't change a manufacturer because the C track is uh I actually believe it or not, I asked Yanko that too, where is C track made? He said it's made in the factory in Hungary. So um whether uh whether their formula changed or not, uh we don't have that information. I did I did actually notice that putting the putting together the display this weekend in the um in the booth i did notice there were some pieces of track that were different from others and um 
it was just slightly greener, so to say. The gray is kind of a slightly greener to my eye. Uh, so I really, I really can't say. There's a date stamp on each piece of sea track when it was manufactured. So, you know, if you have nothing but time, uh, you can look at the date stamp on the bottom of it and narrow it down. But yeah, I've always noticed there's always a little bit of a color change in there. Um, the only main thing that I would notice, or was that the earlier sea tracks were could get brittle with age, and then you know you just eventually start snapping off the locking tabs. Yeah. The newer ones reformulated as far as that goes. So I would have expected at least a little bit of a color change there, but yeah, uh, sure. and I really count on track color to be consistent anyway. So, you know, and if, if you really are using C track for a bench work where you're putting all kind of scenery on there, uh, you also need to think of your, what's your potential for actually ballasting over the C track anyways, too. So. Right. Right. And it could be that, uh, what I was seeing anyway was first generation C track and next generation C track. Um, even still, that old C track, even if it is brittle, if you if you put it down and leave it down, it's fine. It's not like it doesn't run trains; it runs fine. Do you do? You, that's a good. Here's a question for you: Do you do you consider the uh, the Alpha track as the first C track generation, or did they Again, actually call it I that? I had that conversation with Yanko. <laughs> I said, "Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much first generation C track." And I actually have a, an alpha turnout here where it looks almost exactly like C-Track, but it's, uh, this is alpha. If anyone's familiar with alpha. Can you, what you should do is, can you, you have some C-Track in there? Compare the profiles because it's uh, different. It is slightly different. This is a slightly a smoother, um, grain pattern so to say well, with the ballast well the angle on the edge is actually steeper it, it is slightly different the the code rail height is slightly different also yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right i wonder uh, if that's more towards k-track is k-track higher profile no the c-track was higher profile that's the same profile but the c-track well it will snap it will made up to it you know at least i thought it did maybe because it's a turnout it will made up to it Oh, it's, I see the problem. The problem is this little tiny tab on this rail here. That little tiny tab doesn't. Um, yeah, that little alignment groove. Or that's the only like thing that doesn't line. line up. But other, other than that, it does fit and made up. It's a, this, the alpha track is a little bit narrower. The, the grain is a little bit finer. The contacts underneath are copper instead of um, stainless steel. It's also darker. It's, uh, that's and it's a darker, speaker. it's almost a black. Yes. Um, a darker gray. It's kind of funny, you know, here this gentleman's talking about, you know, his problem with C-Track and we go into Alpha Track. <laughs> but I did, I did mention that to Yaka. I said, yeah, it's like a first generation C-Track. And he goes, yeah, by all means, it is a pretty much a first generation C-Track. So I, I, whenever I see this for sale at a, at a, at a swap meet or a, um, or a show, I buy it, the Alpha Track. I, I definitely buy it. There you go, folks. You you can uh, you can purchase it before Rick and then charge there them. Yeah, you, you can try. <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, you probably have very little use for it yourself. I have I have almost none. Yeah, but maybe eventually I'll have an oval. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, I think that kind of holds us. Uh, we're at a. Stand still on any kind of questions you want to go ahead and uh, begin your uh, your uh, program. Yeah, start for today. Talking about uh, obviously we talk about our the newsletter um, because yeah we might I think later on we might try to look over and see if there's actually any questions that we can address that are sent to us on YouTube. You know we're kind of terrible at answering YouTube uh, comments. Um, so the, the, it's generally a while. It's better if you guys want to reach out to us to just send us emails at digital at marklin.com and then we can answer your questions there more uh, efficiently. So, yeah, anyways. we don't monitor the YouTube channel for questions. Uh, we actually get told there's a comment or question on there because, yeah, we just yeah sending comments but uh, just be aware that if you do add questions in there it may be a while before we actually get a chance to realize they're there <laughs> so 
Oh, 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 oh. Before we do this, let me get out of here. Yeah. Um, the 844. I wanted to mention that in the webinar. So we just had yeah. uh, our, our club train show up in the Bay Area, which we, we totally didn't expect this to happen. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Mark, listened, Mark came to um, Curtis and myself about a year ago and said they wanted some sound files. Like they wanted us to record some engineer sounds. So we recorded engineer sounds. They wouldn't tell us what locomotive it was for, but they wanted it to be, it was for an American locomotive. And that's all they told us. Um, then lo and behold, the 844 comes out and our sound files that we recorded are in the 844. So anybody who has the UP 844, 37984, um, you can actually hear Curtis and I doing horrible representations of engineer and fireman. We never designate who is who in, in that. We just, we specifically called each other by name um, just, just to see if anybody would recognize us. And this came out in December last year. So it's been um, technically seven months since this locomotive came out when uh, somebody finally mentioned, well, was that your voices in the 844? And so what Curtis and I had done, you know, it took us a little while to figure this out, but we decided to have a prize for anybody who came out and said, is that your voices or I heard your voices, anything about our voices being in the 844? Well, only- yeah, well, let's actually say it another way. It, we actually had a prize for the first person. The first person. Yes, the first person. So don't don't everyone say you want to pry. And um, we uh, the only stipulation to this little uh, prize was they had to actually have the eight forty four locomotive. And um, of course, we didn't ask for a receipt or anything because it wasn't an official contest. So we uh, we we were able to make up our own rules and do whatever we wanted. But somebody finally at at the show in in uh, in the Bay Area in July. Uh, which is a club show, somebody finally mentioned it, and it was uh, Gordon Scholes. And so we sent them the prize, and the prize was uh, we had a Marklin pocket watch. So we sent them a Marklin pocket watch, which I'm sure was not made at the Marklin factory. But um, we haven't heard back from him, so I really don't know if he got it, but I mailed it to him. But Gordon, good job. Wanted to tell you good job. because Congratulations, Gordon. Yes. <laughs> And it was the last place I would expect somebody to, to ask at that show, being just a small club show. Uh, but it worked, and we did it, and yeah. And that, uh, by the way, that is an ETE show, more or less. Uh, we don't want you to think it was just within, like, the Bay Area Chapter Club. So uh, yeah, anybody, any- it was a public event, so anybody can come to it. Yeah. So. But the club, the local club the chapter puts it on. So anyway. I, I was really happy to see somebody. Else. Yeah, and and Rick, even though he, you know, he says, you know, it's a representation of an engineer and, and uh, to a coal shoveler, it, it really isn't. It's just really terrible stuff. It's terrible. <laughs> uh, it's terrible dialogue. We're almost embarrassed to listen to it ourselves. So. You know, but it always sounds terrible when you do it yourself, when you hear your own voice, for yeah. one. But it was too forced, you know. We tried to say, "Well, we can do better. We'll practice it. We can do better." They said, "No, no, no. This, this is fine." They didn't even um, give us a chance. So. Yeah, whether <laughs> whether they ever ask it again, Curse I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess we can name names. Specifically, Marco from the factory. Marco, we love Marco you. Marco Lefley. Yeah, you may see him. He, he you'll see him in the uh, insider videos. So yeah. insider club videos. So he does some presentations up there. He's a good guy. Uh, and uh, thanks for letting us do that. But uh, yeah, he has a better on-screen presence than we do. <laughs> <laughs> we will fully admit it. Yeah. So anyway, uh, let's get on to the newsletter. The topic was, ironically enough, we've already covered a little bit of it, was the uh, the turntable and um, working the turntable with the mobile station because I had a, well, I still have a, a Markland fan that was trying to get his mobile station to work with the um, with the turntable. And I quickly um, found out that the problem was not really his 
his turntable. It, it, it's more that he was following the instruct the printed instructions, and the printed instructions don't really tell you too much about, if any, about a um, a mobile station. So, uh, with that, if you guys can see my screen, can you see my screen? The instructions. Yeah, it's it seems to be being showed. Okay. And it's not going to show a hand. It probably just shows my little line of a cursor. Um, obviously, I can't stress enough, beat it or, or beat it into everyone's head enough to mount it correctly. Um, you have to know how to use the turntable with a mobile station, which is basically using the uh, the keyboard of the mobile station. So I didn't want to get into the explanation of how to use a keyboard because I think I've covered that in a previous newsletter way back when. So uh, you need to be familiar with how to use the keyboard to operate the mobile station. Um, basically, that's that. And if you want to mute your microphone, Curtis. Uh, okay, I muted. So um, the manual online says something, you know, doesn't say something totally different it explains everything but on page 15 the manual online has this what i have highlighted in this red box added to it and this is the uh this is the important part this tells you everything the turntable will do and what address will will do it now the problem with the uh the user that i had was he kept thinking that the 72760 was what he needs to do with button one, two, three, and four. And, he, and he's trying to push button one, two, three, and four on the mobile station where that wasn't doing anything. Um, so I had to get him over that hurdle to understand that the mobile station instructions are only online right now. Hopefully in the new turntable, the manual will be printed with these. I'm assuming they will. Um, they don't give us this information, so we really can't say what's going to happen. But at any rate, um, if you'll notice that the address is 225 is where it starts. And that corresponds to, uh, what did I say, uh, turntable page, I forget the turntable page that is, keyboard page 15. Now you got to remember the keyboard page is these go the pages go back to um the 6021 days where you had four sets of four so you had 16 uh turnouts you could control on one keyboard and so that's the way the mobile sh station is set up that once you get to one to 15 then 16 starts keyboard page number two even though on the keyboard, you can see here, um, it gives you address numbers, but it tells you what keyboard page. <clears throat> so if you're not familiar with why they did this, it can be a little bit confusing, but that's why you see keyboard 15 in this picture. And then it's address 237, 238 is what I happen to be on in this picture. When you have a, don't you have the same kind of reference with the CS2? Because that did pages and yes, 16. the CS2 did the same thing. They followed that through on the CS2, having keyboard pages, because uh, it would show basically one page on the whole screen. It would show 16 addresses on one screen. So that was one keyboard. So yeah, you're right. I didn't even think of that, Curtis, but um, that's entirely true. Uh, so that's why i say you need to be familiar with how a key, the the keyboard works on the mobile station i wasn't going to get into those instructions because that's a different topic so um at any rate uh you can do every function that the turntable can do with the with the uh keyboard on the mobile station all the sounds all the rotation the only thing you can't do is so to say push the icon on the screen because the icon doesn't load to go to what spur you need. Um, you can do every other function you want and go to whatever segment you want. Uh, and all the segments are addressed 229 to 236. Now, I'm not going to get into the debate on why they did the turntable here. Um, 
as address 229 in red. Um, basically, the way I see it is it should have been green because red is on the top of the keyboard page and green is on the bottom. If you look down here, red is on top. So 229 red should be red as the first button and green is the second right in here. But I understand why they did it with green because they didn't, basically they didn't want you to get confused thinking 229 red to 236 red and only the red buttons work. So they needed a representation of red and green as far as the destination track. So that's basically why they did it. Any, any other reason than that? Um, I don't know. That's just what I surmised from it. So um, a, as I said, you can go to um, indexing to any piece of track that you want uh, by selecting which track you want. So two, uh, it's, it's easier if I show this diagram here. 229 red to 236 red. This is where the bridge will stop. You have to set the direction of travel first. Otherwise, it's, it won't go the direction you want, but it will end up in that position. Uh, the turntable has 30 segments. And because you're basically dividing the number 30 by two, because there's two ends of the bridge, it only needs to keep track of 15 segments when it counts. So it counts to 15 and then counts to 15 again and again, or less if you're, if you're not rotating 180 degrees. That's basically how the turntable works. Um, so 229 red is one address, 229 green is a second one, and on and on until 236 red, which is the 15th segment. And after that, it just starts counting again. So if you, if you wanna go to obviously say 233 red, that's what you would do. You would go to keyboard, I believe it's still page 15, and go to address 233, select the red button back up here. This, I have 237, 238 here, but let's just say 237. Um, you select red or green and we'll switch to, pretend I said 237, oh, which isn't even on here. Um, so if you go 230, 232 green, you would end up in this segment, obviously. I mean, it would, the, the bridge would be spanning across to 232 green to the other side also. So because I didn't have a, a locomotive on the bridge, it didn't matter to me which way it turned or where it stopped, uh, which, which end of the, the turntable stopped at say 232 for my article purposes. But you'll want to select the, the direction first because otherwise you could be facing your, um, your locomotive in the wrong way. And so you would obviously go to um, 227 red or green to select the direction you wanna go and then go to the address you want from 229 to 236. And then it, it just goes right to that segment. Now, if you don't have those little, um, pieces, the encoder pieces that I explained, or we explained earlier, it's going to skip that number. It's not going to count it as a number and your numbering will be off. It, it, it will count to 15, but it will actually be going 16 segments if you're missing one of those segments or one of those, one of those encoder pieces. Um, so you really need to make sure they're in there and in there correctly. Uh, otherwise, it, it won't work correctly. Um, next, uh, setting track one. Now the, the turntable thinks it knows where track one is from the factory. It just says, you know, this is track one and it will probably be, it will be address 229, but you don't know exactly where 229 is going to be on when you get it out of the box. Now I believe I could be wrong, but I believe this is the configuration of the, um, segments i could i could very well be wrong when you get it out of the box i don't remember and i know i've moved them around but i think it's set for track one when it comes out of the box i believe it will be a track section not a blank section like these and that's what it says for 229 so if you're just taking it out of the box setting it on your layout and 
orienting it after you mount it correctly, orient it where you want track one to be, then you're fine. You don't have to go through any process. Um, when I wrote this article, I wrote it as somebody who is not going to read the manual first. So I didn't refer to the manual when I wrote this article. Uh, there are other aspects in the um, manual that will tell you a couple of things about track one, but I'm going to cover that in my next article. Um, so you can uh, just, just wait for that. So um, the way I set track one was I let it find track one wherever it thought it was. And then I unlock the turntable using, uh, what is it, 225 green. You press 225 green and it will unlock that lever that Curtis was talking about earlier. And you can freely rotate the bridge wherever you want. Now, you got to be careful not to push on the handrails uh, or on the, the cabin. You don't want to push on anything that's fragile because this is a model. Um, my analogy is you don't pick up your locomotive and, and take it over to your layout, carrying it by the pantograph. This is the same thing. These are fragile. They're, they're scales, so they are going to break easily if you don't take care of them. Um, you can turn the turntable by hand by pushing below the handrail on either side, and then you will have no problem turning it. It will... Um, it will move to wherever you want. You put it on track one, where you want track one, unlock the, the lock using 225 uh, green again, and it will think it's at track one still, and that will be your track one. So that's just a little workaround, or you can, the manual does say how to find track one, but I'll cover that in the next article. Um, and uh, lastly, what did I cover? Oh, the last thing um, I covered, because this, this paragraph you know, tells you just what I told you about finding track one. The last thing I covered was um, you need to um, make sure the turntable is mounted properly. Like we said, I'm just going to say it again because I keep saying it. And you have to have the motor cover underneath the turntable, you have to have it set on the fingers that are supposed to hold the the uh, the the turntable um i've had several turntables in for warranty repair that the people say they don't work right i mounted them on my piece of cardboard and literally i have a piece of cardboard which i'll show you right here it's just a regular piece of cardboard but i do have the fingers mounted on it with hot glue and the turntable sits on it. Um, actually, it's the outer ring that turn that it sits on, not on the motor cover. My mistake there. Um, but again, if I can make these work with no problems on a piece of cardboard, they should it should work correctly for everyone else. Now, um, I did have a, a gentleman where he he had it mounted correctly. It was on the fingers, but his layout kind of bowed down, so there was there was a slight gap between the outer ring of the turntable and those fingers. And that's enough to cause it to have a problem. It just needed to be shimmed up to where it was being supported all the way around on those fingers. I mean, if you have to get a piece of paper and put it in there to feel if it's actually touching or not, by all means do that because the better you mount it, the better it will work. Um, so, um, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, I can't stress anything more than mount it correctly. Uh, know your, your turntable. Uh, I'm sorry, know your keyboard on your mobile station and enjoy it. I actually had a lot of fun with it, just mounted to the, uh, or connected to the mobile station. And I realized um, how much, all the functions that, that it can do with the mobile station, which is, as many as it does with the central station. So that's about it. I will uh, stop sharing, but I can refer to that once again at some point. Um, yeah, actually, uh, if you don't mind sharing that again, I want to yes, comment on something here. Can you go back to the uh, 
go back to the software icon, the control icon page. Here. Yeah. Okay. So I think, so the one thing I always had issue with that I wasn't too sure how it worked is the on the second um, row there is the unlocking icon. Yes. Okay. And the uh, the problem I had, it's just a one way switch. In other words, you He's activate it. About this. Yeah, yeah. And the problem I had is when you activated it, it doesn't say it doesn't tell you when it relocks. It doesn't change colors or anything. No, it doesn't. On the, and, on the icon for the central station, no, it doesn't. Yes. Yeah, so the problem is like if you're trying to move it to an unlocked position or use the motor or whatever to unlock it, you I, it didn't indicate anywhere in the manual how long that thing stays unlocked for or what makes it relock itself. So yeah. that was that was troublesome for me trying to sort out the software. Yeah, you have to you have to push the button again. Yeah, but the thing is, you don't know what the interval is. Like, is is the thing unlocked for a second, or is it unlocked? No, for I think it's second? until you push it again. And I always hear it because you can hear the uh, the servo going. Yeah, you can hear the servo, but the thing is, uh, I mean, when I was messing with it, it would relock itself, and I had no indication of why, other than if I had to listen to it. And right. You know, the thing is, who knows if I would have, was going to damage it because the icon just didn't really give you clear explanation. Well, no, what they happens, could have fixed that. If, it's, if it is unlocked and you try and give it a command to move, it will give you the error beeps. The beep, beep, beep. Well, that's if you're, I guess, if you're moving it, uh, like I would try to, I would move it manually because I think yeah. when it's unlocked, you can actually move it manually. Yes, that's and what that's, that's a problem because you don't really know when it relocks itself unless you try to um yeah it just to yeah. me it was i sent them i tried to explain it's like you should have a different icon to let you know when it is locked or unlocked so that you can just look at it on screen or have it change colors like yeah in a, a function exactly locomotive yeah locomotive. color yeah yeah that definitely would benefit so all right well cool that's uh that's our topic i know the other half of the um so maybe I'll put it out to you folks who are viewing us. Um, I know my topic was basically about the track planning software. Um, but however, when you purchase Markland's track planning software, it only becomes in German, which I sort of addressed in the email. Um, uh, so the, the question is, if you guys have any questions on the track planning software, we can talk about it other than other than that, I didn't really know if it was really useful to talk about the German only track planning software when, uh, you know, it's just like, I don't really know how much I can talk about the English version, but I can definitely show you how to use some of the stuff in the software. Uh, we do have a hand raised. So, uh, hi, Arvids, go ahead and you're going to need to uh, activate your microphone. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I would like to know if that can also be used with the LGB track. Uh, what are we referring to now? The track planning software. Uh, yeah, there is actually an LGB uh, access. Uh, I think the version that I showed in the webinar was an earlier version. There's a, a version number 10 out there now. And uh, I can't verify because I, I, I somehow they sent it to me in like a brown paper bag wrapping. And, and I can't really indicate. I don't know where it is. It was just a sleeve. It wasn't really a, a software thing. But they do have LGB track profiles that you can use. And uh, if you can, uh, I'll go ahead and open up the software and then I can kind of show you where that is accessed. Okay? Okay. All right. So give me a moment while I load up the software. And I'll, I'll keep your mic open right now while I do oh, something. If you. you have any other questions. <clears throat> yeah. Any other questions? Uh, okay, so let me uh, share my screen. Well, I, I'm thinking this is a Windows only. Do they have a Macintosh version as well? Uh, unfortunately, no, there is no Mac version for this software. So this is the, you guys can see the window, okay? Yes. Okay, so this is basically, if you go over here, your track indicator list, there is, um, yeah, I don't need the help window. You can actually come down here and actually select which type. There should be, I believe, hopefully there should be LGB track planning in here. It's not, it might not be available in the German version. Um, one thing that I, I, I can't really, it's one of those things because we're doing marketing webinars or marketing articles, I can't really tell you, uh, you know, I don't really promote the source sort of company that developed it. 
but the, they do have LGB trackage here. And, and why don't I open that up anyways, and you guys can see that as well. You may be able to get the track um, library from this other company as well. Um, let me go ahead and open that up. And the one I have is actually an older version. Let me share that screen. New share and okay, so this is it. It this also would have see it's got quite a few more pieces of track library. Um, let's see if there's a library here. I think symbols files. Uh, so under there's a module symbols files. Uh, let's see if they've actually got any LGB in here. And here you go. See Lehman Gorspan nickel plate mm -hmm. stuff. So you can actually get uh, uh, track libraries from another source and you should be able to load it up in, into even the Markland software. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's a little bit, yeah, it's kind of puts us in a weird bind here mm -hmm. uh, what we can and can't talk about. So. Okay. I understand. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, sure. Sure. Uh, Great. Um, let's see. Let's see. Okay, we got them up there. Uh, okay. Uh, we have a questions here. Which icon on the CS3 Plus sets the predetermined direction on the turntable? The green on the bottom screen moves deck one segment. The black in the center moves deck 180. Let's see. Let me, uh, I'll see if I can answer that. Uh, I, I don't know why we have Arvid's screen still on. Uh, we got to tell him, we got to. You got to say something. It would be. Um... I'm going to load up. I'm going to load up a profile. So give me a second here. I'll just. Okay. We, we could show in the, on the, um, if you have the, the web, if you have it up on the markland.com, markland.de site. In, in the instructions, it gives the icons. Uh, okay. Yeah, you want. So that's the marking site. Yeah, the one you had up before. The instructions. Yeah, give me a sec. Because I graded it out in my article, I could show that, but I graded it out, and it's not the best I, resolution. I think I closed the window. So. share the screen here you might need to redirect me here uh the, right there in the, the icon page. and it, it's it's right right there on the down 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 those these two yeah. yeah oh you can go to the english version if you want you're in you're in the oh. here we go there you go but those are what the icons look like it's set the direction And let me, I'm going to restore a profile here if I can. Yeah, I don't know if I have a profile on my central station. And actually, um, you can add, you can answer Ben's question while you're loading up the uh, VNC viewer. Show him how it works. Uh, yeah, I already have it loaded up. So, well, actually, all right, give me a second here. Stop share. Let me look at the questions. All right. So just hopefully uh, I might need clarification on the question here. Uh, let's see. You're not sharing your screen. Yeah, no, I know. I'm kind of looking over the questions really quickly. Okay. So this. All right. So you're uh, he was basically asking about the controller for the turntable, right? Yeah. Keyboard. So, yeah. 
So, uh, yeah, these are your left uh, counterclockwise and clockwise yeah, indicators. I, I see what he's saying there. Yeah, those icons aren't in there. He says they actually only turn. Um, yeah, so that that direction that he's talking that we were just showing looks like it might only be in the keyboard. Your article list. Go up to your article list. No. Oh, the, the article list. I got gotcha, you. Got gotcha. you. Uh, All the way down. No. no. So that's. Don't, don't select that. Go down. Ooh. Yeah. So that's it. You have to access yeah. it. You have to access it using one of these. So your only indicator was whether or not it's moving counterclockwise or but clockwise. See, those those icons move at one one position. They don't give you a direction. Well, okay, so I'm a little confused because when you click on it, it's either going to move counterclockwise or clockwise. No, 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 no. Those rotated 180 degrees. These? Yes. And this just indicates one at a time. Oh, so when you're selecting a specific track, it doesn't really give you a direction of which well, way. You don't, you don't, the question? Well, yeah, you're right. I was going to say you don't need to because you're se selecting a specific track, but it, it may be going the wrong way. Yeah. So, yeah, that's actually it, a good point. Um <laughs> And I think I ran into that too. I don't know if it's based on where the, so it's easy to forget which one end of the turntable is the indicator of where, where it counts. Does it count under the cab or does it count under the other end, right? Um, maybe yeah. it goes to whatever's closest. It goes, I believe it goes in the last direction it was going. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah, there's no, yeah. I, I, I get the question now, and I, I don't know whether I noticed that before or not when we were writing about it. Mm. Um, well, no, I haven't written about it with the CS3. I wrote about it with the CS2 and now the mobile station. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I, wonder if it, I wonder if you could take a two-step approach then. Um, so basically what it is, you just start it in one direction and you know whether or not you use this one and then right away click on the track you want it to go you can't give it more than one command but you you would have to go so you're saying it won't it won't override it won't supersede just this no. 180 no, you'd have to hit the stop button and then give it the new command uh, okay yeah it doesn't really give you a predetermined direction does it no that's that is a very good point maybe the new one will hmm Okay, that's a good question. Stump the tech guys. All right. uh, okay, is Marklin planning a better CS3 interface for the PC with full functionality, unlike the web version? And then he goes on to the next question. Next one. Yeah, uh, to some degree, you're kind of asking whether or not the, the screen is scalable. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's kind of frustrating. I know that it's like when you see uh, some some marketing documentation where they're talking about the screens and they have all these icons on there. Uh, and then when you actually try to apply those, it doesn't really work. Um, uh, it's, I'm not too sure how they, uh, how to answer that. You know, it's just like, yeah, these, the, some of the images that I've seen on paper, uh, I can't get a good representation on the screen, whether or not, uh, they're going to do a better interface, uh, at least, uh, through VNC viewer. I can't really tell you. Um, I think that's out of our domain. Yeah. Um, but I, I kind of agree with you. You, you really can't, you really can't scale things very well. Um, I mean, even if I was on the screen and just tried to even zoom in or out, it really doesn't kind of help you out. Like here's just sort of like mimicking uh, the small screen. And you know, the, the funny thing about this, and I, I talk about this with some people that your icons these icons like when you're trying to click on one or the other um and especially when it in regards to track they have what they call a hot section and that's basically the clickable area it's a radius so like this turnout for instance you know when you set up these turnouts and you plan it you see you have a blue circle around it when you're when you're trying to move it when you're in edit mode uh, let me go into edit mode and i can might be easier to illustrate that way so we'll uh, edit the trackboard page 
Okay, so when you click on this, for instance, um, one way we look at it is that the, the blue circle represents the clickable radius. So anytime you click around it, it clicks on that turntable. So when you're not in edit mode, you know, you, you know you're kind of clicking on it. You see I'm not really clicking on it. You have that radius, right? The, the problem when you have something like that, when you build a track page, and uh, I'll just kind of destroy this plan. I don't need to save it for anything. Let me just kind of drag this right next to it here, right? And and you try to click on one or the other, like in between, uh, you know, there can be an overlap. It, see, it doesn't even activate this lower one, even though I'm closer to it, right? So these radiuses are overlapping. And whether or not you're zoomed in or out, may not even make a difference okay so maybe that's a little bit it helps a little bit but you know see how it is that there's still radiusing that's going on there so when you're building track plans and you have your turn your your turnouts too close to each other it's like that clickable radius doesn't really scale out when you're going zoom tighter or closer and you have to spread things around especially if you're in a situation where you knew you need to right away click something and like if I needed to hit that top one and I, I only have a you know half a second to get it to change it's not going to change that top one because I'm in the wrong area and that radius is kind of annoying because it doesn't really kind of resize itself according to how big or how small something is um and that's sort of the nature of programming icons and graphics um th they can't really kind of make the um these are basically when they're developing icons for push buttons one gets it's, layered over the other yeah it's a general shape they can't make it form fitting like this where you click on it specifically so you know you can't ask too much from programmers to actually fix that um you, we kind of have to adjust uh as we develop these things zoom out a little bit on that no out in out oh, okay that's too far you can't read it yeah so that's the other thing. When you zoom too far out, your your readable areas um, they don't necessarily get um, rescaled. I can't remember. If, let's see. I think we can put text labels on here. Well, they're they're already on there, except that you're zoomed in too far for them to see. Yeah, but you can actually add different text labels too. You can actually add text to this. Okay. Yeah. So and okay. uh, as as Rick was saying, you know the. the closer you get you see how t1 shows up to indicate that it's uh, the uh, turn it's the turnout one or eight see what I, what I wanted to point out is uh the name of that nerd up in the upper left hand corner oh yeah <laughs> you didn't notice that before <laughs> that's what I started laughing at <laughs> I don't know if you guys get that so yeah we built the turntable bed for a show and this was basically the track design that we used. And I just thought it was hilarious that I saw the shape in it. So, and I built it in 2021 at the last uh, train show in the West. So, so. Okay, so uh, back to Paul, um, which this is a good, maybe a good workaround. He said, the only way to, uh, the way, the only way I found to drag the track, it, it was to drag the track with the mouse in the direction you want. So to get the bridge to go the way you want, the only way he figured out, you know what? I, I seem to recall that too. You, oh, you, you mean the turntable? Yeah, you set the direction by dragging the mouse the direction you want. So, like this way? Yeah. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so you I seem to recall that. that. It's been a long time since I used it with the CS3. Um, so, okay, so you can preset the election by clicking on it, right? Yes. Yes. Let's see. So, maybe, maybe it's uh, right or wrong. I don't. Uh, have to put mine back together again. So. Did, did you ever get a servo for that? Uh, well, I don't think it might not be the servo that was the issue. I think it was the software because of just trying to get the thing to function correctly. Who knows if I just kind of maybe it was an unstable decoder and I, I blew it. So I have to I have to basically reprogram a new one. So yeah, yeah, they just snap right. Yeah. I've done that. Yeah. So, because the servo might still be in good shape. So I have to, I'm going to try it with another decoder first. And then if that works, then I don't have to worry about the servo. Uh, I do have some micro servos that I had on other projects. And uh, I don't know if they're easy to find or not. So, so thanks for the uh, little uh, the tip on that there. 
it's been a while since I've played with it with the mobile or with the central station. I did it with the mobile station, obviously, and it, uh, it it works great. I mean, I'm really impressed with how well it works with the mobile station. Your uh, camera's not on, Curtis. If that matters to you. No, I was just turning back on. Okay, um, then let me check here. See if we have any questions on the uh, nothing from YouTube folks and cover the menu okay uh, and let's see is there anything else that we can cover or you have any questions folks out there any more questions any any kind of news that we can relay or Anything that's been put out there? Let's no, you know, we don't get any any kind of marketing heads up on what's coming out, what the factory is developing. Uh, okay, so I guess what we'll do is let's kind of answer questions that we got on the old channels. Uh, actually, the one sort of main question is we do have comments uh, regarding uh using contact tracks so the two four nine nine fives uh that's what we usually use for uh activating at least rick and i like to use them for activating events um some uh, we have a gentleman asking about using the those sort of contact tracks with a, a mobile station one you mean a circuit track uh two four nine nine five is a contact track it's the contact track pair isn't it it's a circuit track Contact track we make. Circuit track comes with a little flipper in the middle for C track. Yeah, but they have remember they have the contact track pairs. Oh, that's right. You're you're right. You're right. Sorry. We we keep yeah, we never use those because we just clip the bridge. So I keep forgetting about those. Yeah, so the contact track sets uh, so the basically essentially the questions he wants to know how to use the contact tracks with the mobile station one. Um and that yeah it's a little weird on that because first of all unlike a central station mobile stations do not really allow you to use contact tracks in the context of triggering events so in this sense the contact tracks are going to be used sort of in an analog function and i think rick and i were talking about it earlier uh, it's a bit tricky because you would actually use the contact track to um, mimic the push button switches which basically uh rather than when you use the push button switches it basically closes the loop to a ground control or you know it just takes whatever wire you've wired up and it connects to the brown wire um and this is how uh 24995 would work whatever you got going to ground is going to do the same thing i can't give really specific examples because i haven't done it that way um well the problem the only problem with that is yes it would work but the contact track activates whatever accessory while there is a train on the um on that section so the problem with the contact track is if you run a long train and you have it turning one of the modern light signals um you don't want it to have constant power going to it so to say to change it i guess yeah. technically it would go through an m84 at that point and maybe it's okay but if yeah you're, if you're doing one of the old analog signals changing it contact track those are pretty robust it's probably okay but you don't want you don't want a, a train sitting on that it'd be like if you have the the old blue buttons hooked up to a um a signal and you sat there and you just held the button down for a long length of time it's going to heat up that coil it's going to melt it right so so, the yeah. contact track really isn't the way to go in that in that uh feature it's a um a circuit track is what you want to use because then it's just a momentary pulse yeah and so if he's using a contact track to turn a turnout with the mobile station one he's going to blow the the uh, solenoid in in the in the motor 
Right. I think he basically was asking, he talking, I think he said something about talking about routing. So that's the same issue that you, you can't use them for that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The one instance that we have done and I it's just, you talking about it reminded me, um, and that what it, what it, what I used it for was I used an occupation track to basically do what some analog users have done that if you have a train that goes into a station, I would use that to turn on power to lights and you know um and if you're going to use led light bulbs it's a little more complex because then you actually want to rectify the signal just to get all that flicker out from the digital code you can use that to directly supply power to a light but it's not in used in any kind of momentary situation like turning a turnout or switching a light you don't want to use that so yeah rick's correct there Okay. All right. Uh, you, Gary gave you a little shout out for the engine light edits. I you really don't know what engine he's talking about. Uh, you made him fade in and fade out. So, um, yeah. I think he bought one off eBay from a gentleman that I had done the conversion for. And um, yeah, it was fade in, fade out lights. Uh, okay, so I have a question. How did I create the train tracking grid? Do you have to assign S88s to each contact in the grid? <laughs> oh boy, yeah, uh, you're you're diving deep into no man's land. <laughs> yeah, I, I um, you might want to take that uh, as a as a phone <laughs> question because uh, I don't know that we have that much time. Well, I'll pull it up so people understand what we're saying and then whether or not we need to answer it is another. But can you look at the second question while I pull that up and then uh, see if it's something you can answer? That's from anonymous attendee. So. Okay. Uh, it says uh, follow up from the guy with the M83 that didn't register the uh, right addresses. I got another M83, set the, or I got an M83, set it to address one to four, it works fine, and set one, a second one um, that likes nine to 12 to nine to 12. I don't understand what he means by that. And it works okay with that. The hassles of my turnout addresses are now out of sequence. Um, in, in your keyboard, I'm assuming they're out of sequence in the keyboard where you can, you may have your keyboard set alphabetically or um, you can set them to the address or the item, what the item is. So you may be, so it may be sorting your articles differently so uh that may it may be just as simple as simple as uh sorting your articles up at the top there'll be a a, a tab well not a tab but a a, a sub menu where you can pull the menu down with the arrow and and sort it the way you want it uh it might be as simple as that i can't say for sure um you'd have to try it and see uh, see if that's the problem but it, if you're if you address two M83s, because I don't understand what you mean by um, and set the set the one that likes nine to twelve to nine to twelve, and it works okay with that. So I really don't what you, don't know what you mean by that. Um, maybe you give us a call and or raise your hand and you can explain it. I don't know. Um, it could be just a matter of me not understanding your question. But I know that you can sort uh, your articles differently, just like you can sort your uh, locomotives by type or address or by name. Uh, ben says, name the, name the KD3 and sort by name, not number. Yeah, that would do. And then it will sort them by number. I think they're sorted by addresses right now, and it depends on what address you or or what mobile 
new mobile station. What turnout is in what port of the K83 also? You may have to change the ports for the turnouts. Okay, so let me. Um... Let me share my screen for an answer to the question there, or somewhat. It's either answer the question or evade the question. Take it, take it however you want. <laughs> All right, grab, grab your milk and your blankets. All right, uh, this is the grid that uh, the gentleman was talking about. Um, and uh, you know what? I might. Do you have a microphone, Phil? I understand this, but I'm not crazy enough to actually do this. Well, you understand the process, but I'm, oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm a little lost on his questions. So I just wanted to see if we could maybe throw him in there and he can clarify, but I've closed the window. So I don't have Phil raised his hand. Where'd your hand go? Phil, whoop. Oh, there you go. All right, Phil, you're, uh, I've got you where you can talk, so if you can unmute your microphone. There you go. Okay. <laughs> I kind of have a vague idea, but I'm I kind of got lost in your question. So and 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 unfortunately, see uh, this is one thing that I want to say. This thing is so daunting that once <laughs> I got it working, I don't want to look at it again. Um <laughs> yeah. It is cool though. <laughs> so anyways, go ahead. What was uh Actually, if I could interject uh, uh, real quick. It is very cool to see this process work on his layout. It is extremely cool, but this is this is computer programming, not just putting events in. This is this is definitely deep in the rabbit hole. Uh, no, I, I realize that. Um, I'm trying to set up some automation on my outdoor garden railway. Okay. And I don't think I'll have nearly as many track blocks as you have, but I, I, I kind of understand how things are being, uh, or how your assignments work and everything. Right. The, the question is, do you have to have a real S88 contact for each of these, or can you create a dummy S88 thing? Uh, okay, what? yeah. That's a really good question. Okay, so essentially what we do or what's going on here is that for for any events that are basically track uh, um, track control events, I should say. And what I mean by that, folks, is that I am actually controlling turnouts, uh, stop blocks, and signals. Those you do need to have S88s for. Okay. Now for the tracking events here, or at least where I'm actually controlling a locomotive, and and you can see you can see all these dots along the bottom of the screen that I'm showing. Those are all the events in total, and it puts everything together. And I'm going to group these, so you have you have basically track triggers. Um, and let me scroll down the groupings that I put. So you know I have a depot. Uh, things are controlling locomotive specialization staging yard so all these sort of things are actual physical s88s and what i found out was that because i'm doing all this tracking and i'm trying to figure out where the locomotives are this did not involve s88s um luckily because i mean think about all these s88s i mean i have on the bottom row here is uh, what uh is uh, 15 and uh, 10 14 icons and that means i would have had to have bought you know at least five more s88s just to do it that way and you don't so these are basically contactless entries and um and like i said it was a little daunting for me so i forget what i method i used on this when i created the article and i think i can look it up here so let's look at our article list and uh and you can see i don't have uh i don't have uh let's see these are solenoid accessories so let's look at the rs88s here so whether or not i use one so these are actual cool physical s88 inputs mm -hmm. uh, and what these are these are the non ones are controlling contacts that's what it was so con controlling contacts do not require an actual s88 okay 
which is okay, how how do you actually assign something to a controlling contact could could you just go through a quick setup of uh creating a contact that's a controlling contact uh okay all right so so um I just want to make it simplified because I don't want to really lose people on that. So how this works is, um, <laughs> and we might take this offline at one point. Uh, you, we might have to. Uh, I might have to review this. So essentially, what I did was these controlling contacts are uh, basically I'm using them for information just to get an idea of where something is. Okay. And and what's happening is I'm using my existing S88 contacts to actually activate these sensors. So um, so what's going on? And let me see if I can find an event where I actually do this, and that might actually clarify the issue here. Um, look, sixty base. Okay, so these these contacts that I have here on the left are basically the ones that I use to control all my routing around the track. Okay, and and those are those are not displayed in this window, and it's going to get muddy here because I've got so many windows open. I'm starting to lose track of where I am. So what's happening is, let's see if I can get to this track plan up here. Oops, track board. Here you go. So the contacts that I'm using, and this is, uh, I'll just take one of these pages. These contacts here are my existing icons. These are the ones I use to control routing. And what I do is, even though I have all these different icons, all these different contacts, I'm not using all these to activate the control icon. So in other words, when the train makes this contact, I am doing double duty as it reroutes a train, for instance, I'm also using it to activate one of my control contacts. Okay. okay. So I'm using this trigger to activate the control top contacts. I'm not actually creating another trigger to control it. I'm using my existing triggers to activate the control and contact. So, um, uh, I, it's a little bit long winded, uh, and I think that's as far as it goes. If you need more clarification, send, uh, let's kind of contact each other, you know, through the, through uh, digital at market.com and I can explain it further, but that's essentially what it's doing is I'm rather than having the train activate this trigger as it does, I'm using this trigger, this physical trigger to actually turn on and off my control contacts. And there's no assignment of the control contact. So if we look at that event, uh, let's see if we can do this again. If I look at these control contacts, um, it's not actually being triggered by anything physical. When I open up the edit window, whoops, let me ed edit this again, uh, edit Oracle list. So when I open up a control contact, it doesn't actually, it's not being triggered by anything specifically. Um, why is it not going in edit mode? There you go. Yeah. So I'm not, um, see, there's no stream here. It's just turning these, that event is actually turning on and off these contacts and we can kind of see it in the event here. Um, see, uh, K16 is basically already existing on the layout. It's nothing in specific. Yep. And it goes out. So it's a little convoluted just explanation because, like I said, it was so crazy trying to set this thing up that, uh, and like any programmer that is better than me, um, or you know maybe I'm just terrible at it. When I program something and I get it working, and if I sit too long away from it, I forget how it all works, and, and it's just crazy trying to figure it out again. Okay, so does that help? Um, a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, a little. Yeah, it, it's it's out there. Yeah. So, but the thing is, so here's a here's a question that's sort of relevant. Controlling contacts confuse me. He uses one control contact for multiple events. Why use controlling contacts? Okay, so there's another one. So, so one statement he makes is you can definitely use one contact and use them to activate multiple events. Okay. So don't just think that because you have a contact track you can only use it to control one event. 
Um, and the thing is, the, the what makes that difference is, is you want to be clear what those events are doing and that they are not overlapping in use because it can cause issues. In other words, if you have uh, if you use one event to turn a switch one way and then all of a sudden you add another event to turn it the other way, you're confusing the system because what's going to happen is as the thing gets activated, it's going to start turning the events back and forth. It's going to turn on and off that switch and you don't want that. So you need to do, you need to be sure that if you're going to use one contact to activate multiple events, make sure those multiple events are distinct and that they don't have any overlap and they have a, a unique purpose and you just kind of learn how to isolate that the other part of his uh answer or response was that or question was why do you use control contacts well frankly i didn't really use control contacts before ever and the reason why i used it for this event setup here let's see if i can pull that up again I can't even remember what one I use. Oh no, it's a trackboard. The reason why I use it for track contacts in this context is because it allowed me to, to expand um, what I needed control without actually having to use an S88. And, uh, and so kind of let me reiterate, I've never used control contacts for anything, but they do have their uses and it's sort of contextual. And eventually, you know, you may find that you need one at one point or another. So I can't really define it. It was this kind of came up because I found a real use for it. Um, so, um, but as far as you folks using it, you can just stick with standard events and event uh, and triggers until you come across where you realize you're going to need something that's uniquely different. So I can't, it's hard to de define. These, these can get really kind of confusing. Um, essentially what you're doing is you're adding another level of sort of the conditions that we call in programming, where it's just like, if this condition is satisfied, then you can proceed on with the event script and uh, which is essentially what this tracking does. So uh, yeah, uh, I guarantee it's over a lot of people's heads. It even gets over mine if I don't look at it in a while. Okay. All right. Uh, any other questions after that? Uh, you guys, you had your little five-minute nap, right? So. Oh, uh, is it time to speak now? <laughs> yeah, wise guys. Uh, yeah. Let me stop sharing. Stop sharing. Okay. Uh, it looks like, uh, yeah, we've gone on pretty well. Um, I think we're winding down here. So, yeah, even though we've cut down from a two hour webinar, even an hour and a half, we managed to make it in. <laughs> yeah, every time. Uh, anyways, uh, hope you enjoyed this. Um, thanks for your questions. Thanks for definitely uh, participating and uh, joining us uh also thank you guys for, uh for the folks that joined us on uh youtube appreciate it and uh, i think uh that covers it you got anything uh, last minute you want to add or say rick there uh, nothing i can think of i just woke up so yeah oh i'm glad you guys enjoyed it um appreciate it and uh yeah Rick in his ETE short. See if we get in trouble for that. Yeah, if you get again, so uh, just kind of say, if you guys have questions, do send it to us through digital at martha.com. And we apologize for not monitoring the, the YouTube questions uh, after the fact. Anyway, so we do track them as we're in the webinar. Um, anyways, if you have any questions that need further explanation, um, again, send them to that email address that will help us get some topics sometimes for, uh, articles or webinars. Um, and, uh, hopefully, uh, we'll see you guys again in another couple months, right? Yeah. 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 It would be August, September, October 2nd, hopefully the 2nd, ooh, October. I don't know. That one may be delayed also by a week. Oh, do we get something going on in October? 
I think what uh, the next show that we're planning to go to is in that uh, it's going to be Milwaukee, isn't it? Train Fest in Milwaukee, yeah. Train Fest. Train Fest in Milwaukee, November. Um, November, But in October, it may be delayed a week. So. Yeah, it's going to be delayed. Send me to the factory. Oh, yeah. Hey, you can do it from the factory. I could. I could, but I don't think I want to do it at midnight or whatever. <laughs> That's usually not that late. Mm-mm. Eight at night. Till oh, wait, wait. Oh, wait. You're, yeah, you're heading on your big trip, huh? It would be uh, with a nine hours ahead, so it would be eight till 11. I could do it if I had to. I don't know. Well, I'm not taking my laptop, so. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna have your phone with you, right? So we might get a little bit of a if we can talk him into it, we might get a little bit of a factory tour. I will delay it. Yeah, I'm not gonna be at the factory at nine o'clock at night. Yeah, but you can pre-vid something before that. <laughs> Come on, don't be shy. Hey, what are you trying to get me into here? <laughs> as much trouble as you get me into. <laughs> All right. week in November or, yeah. or October. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. Listen, yeah, just do it. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> telling them. <laughs> I plan on going down where you know they don't let people. I don't know if they'll let me take pictures, but yeah, yeah I'm gonna be just all, all gooey over it. Yeah. Sure. I should warn the the factory now. Hey, watch watch out for those pilfering hands of his. The yeah. uh, might give, be missing me, a blank at one point. Get me into those parts. Yeah, really. yeah. 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 If you if you got a blank that you might think I, I would like, you got to pilfer that one for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so. actually i do have a uh, locomotive i might take i have a you know your um your tourist train the 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 blue and white and green looks like the sky blue oh, yeah, 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 yeah yeah i have one of those where the uh the engineer doesn't come up on each side oh. so i might take that to the factory and say okay let's see what you guys do with this uh, so okay i think it needs a new circuit board myself How's the access on that when you pulled off the shell? That's fine. So you can actually access that guy from the shell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You take the shell off, and 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 it, you know, it's all there. Yeah. There's just two keys, and it's all there. That's that's just making my brain go crazy right now. <laughs> the possibilities, the possibilities. <laughs> yeah, I know. What? Yeah, you're talking about the 103, right? Yeah. 103, yeah. What figure yeah. do you want to put on there? You want to put Santa Claus in there? What? Oh, yeah, who knows? <laughs> be... yeah. You know, and a reindeer on the other side. <laughs> you know, on one side is an angel, and on the other side is the devil. <laughs> yeah, I I we could we could pervert that locomotive pretty good. Yeah, if you guys aren't really familiar with that, that one had the flipping uh, engineer, depending on the train. Direction. direction so that was pretty cool all right we better end it there we're getting silly thanks again guys uh we will see you in a couple months yeah. if uh, if uh, if we're on schedule anyways <laughs> <laughs>